Hello, I am Anand Murthy, Chief of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery at the Union Memorial Hospital, Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. This is a video demonstrating a right shoulder reverse shoulder replacement for rotator cuff tear arthropathy. Reverse shoulder replacement is indicated for patients usually over the age of 65 to 70 years old with a diagnosis of rotator cuff arthropathy or irreparable or chronic rotator cuff disease with or without arthritis. This is an end-stage procedure. It's very complex and it's chosen for these select patients to decrease their pain and improve their function. This patient here is positioned in the beach chair position in approximately 45 degrees of back elevation in the sitting position. Uh, with general anesthesia, the head is held in a very well secured headrest. We prep and drape the patient in a standard fashion with multiple drapes uh, to provide a barrier from anesthesia as well as the uh, outside uh, area around the uh, surgical patient. We have multiple assistants. We have myself as the primary surgeon, a uh, senior surgical resident and a physician's assistant, as well as a surgical scrub and a circulator. This team is put together for their expertise in performing these types of procedures. This is a, an example of our uh, trays and our surgical instruments that we use. We have all of our equipment available uh, for the right reverse shoulder replacement. So this is a 79-year-old right-hand dominant female who presents with a, with a tremendous amount of pain and weakness with a diagnosis of rotator cuff tear arthropathy. See how I straight clamp. We'll be performing a right reverse shoulder replacement uh, on this patient to improve her pain. Uh, decrease her pain, improve her function. We're going to start with a standard deltopectoral incision with an incision base just over the medial coracoid down to the center of the arm. Knife, please. We're developing subcutaneous flaps. Gelpies, please. Forceps, baby rich. So this is our deltopectoral interval. You can see superiorly in the wound, in the incision, we have a fat stripe, fatty triangle that delineates the deltoid from the pectoralis. This is an x-ray of this patient's right shoulder. As you can see, there is very little joint space between the glenoid and the humeral head. Also, there's proximal migration, which means there's a decreased interval between the humeral head and the acromion, as well as irregularities or excrescences on the greater tuberosity indicating long-standing rotator cuff disease or tearing. And we develop a standard fatty stripe that will allow us to get in between the deltoid and the pectoralis. What we're doing here is we're spreading right underneath the deltopectoral interval protecting the cephalic vein. Go ahead and cut through there. Stay medial. Maintain hemostasis with bovi cautery. Prevents us from uh, transfusing these patients. That's a rare thing to, for us to do. This is the large cephalic vein, pectoralis, deltoid. We're going to coagulate these crossing vessels. So now we're going to develop the um, space underneath the deltoid muscle. This is the clavipectoral fascia. We're going to take the large deltoid retractor next, please. The so deltoid retractor will retract the deltoid with that, and it uh, allows us to elevate the humerus into our field. Our conjoined tendon or the strap muscles. This is the subscapularis underneath the strap muscles. We always palpate the axillary nerve. Can I see a large Richardson next? These are the circumflex vessels right here. We're going to coagulate them. Two 
two veins and an artery of the circumflex vessels. Now we'll palpate the biceps groove and identify our bicepital tendon. Here's our bicep sheath. Have an Army Navy, please. As is the case with many patients with rotator cuff tearing, there's a big fluid collections when they become chronic as the synovial fluid from the joint leaks out into the subacromial space. You can see here the biceps tendon is very diseased. We always perform a tenotomy or a tenodesis as the biceps is a uh, significant source of pain. You can see the hypertrophic inflamed synovium. And we'll tenodese this on closure. This is our subscapularis tendon. We'll take that down in full thickness through both capsule and uh, tendon. So we'll just keep releasing the subscapularis. What you want to do is keep the arm in an adducted position to protect the axillary nerve as it runs on the medial superficial surface of the subscapularis tendon. And we will slowly externally rotate the shoulder. You can see all the synovial fluid coming out. We're going to stay underneath the osteophytes as we release the inferior capsule. We put the dera in just underneath the subscapularis tendon and use it as almost like a shoehorn to release the inferior part of the joint. So now we have our medial shoulder exposed. We'll continue to release the capsule all the way around past 6 o'clock. The axillary nerves on the other side of this capsule, so we keep a retractor between that and stay right on bone underneath the osteophytes. And we hyper externally rotate the shoulder. We've gone all the way around to the back to release the posterior capsule. And Brad here can show you the posterior capsule. If we hyper externally rotate, you can see we've exposed the entire posterior joint line as well. This is past six o'clock, and now we should be able to dislocate the shoulder relatively easily. So next we're going to remove the peripheral osteophytes to get a better understanding of what our true anatomy is. are all osteophytes. We're going to take the reamer now to prepare our humerus. You want to aggressively attack these osteophytes reduce the diameter of the humeral head. All of that will give you a better understanding of the true anatomy as well as give you better glenoid exposure, which is the key in all of these shoulder replacements. It's getting better access to the glenoid. So this crown, we call this a crown of osteophytes or ring of osteophytes. Have a rongeur, please. There's a large bursal sac here, which is common with people with large rotator cuff tears. Hold the arm, please. Um, just hold with two hands. It's very common in people with rotator cuff arthropathy to have these large effusions. Let's get back to our humeral position. So this is, we'll introduce this into the humerus down what we call the hinge point or the orthopedic axis, which is the highest point just posterior to the biceps groove. If you see the biceps groove coming up, we've excised the biceps tendon. We're going to go right to the highest point on the lateral margin of the articular surface. Good. All right. Go ahead and put that down. So 
This is a starter reamer that's going to bury this all the way. We're going to take this to about 130 degrees, right about there. Good. Next. And we're going to keep reaming the humeral canal until we begin to get a little bit of cortical feel or cortical chatter. That's good. This implant has a proximally coated trabecular metal surface, and we like to get line-to-line -line reaming. We'll take our humeral cutting guide next. This allows us to resect the proper amount of humerus, maintaining the proper rotation as well. It's a type of a claw type of uh, resector. So these retroversion rods indicate the version of the humeral cut. This is zero degrees of retroversion. This is 20 degrees of retroversion. So if the forearm is lying in between those two, then this will be a 10 degree retroversion cut. We always save the humeral head in case we need to bone graft. Once again, anything to reduce the diameter of the humerus will allow us to get better glenoid exposure. So that's our initial preparation of the humerus. It's a ring retractor that we place behind the humerus for the beginning of this resection. This is the old remnant of subscapularis. We're going to tag this. This is the anterior medial surface of the subscapularis. This is the anterior medial surface of the subscapularis. And the axillary nerve is right here, this yellow structure right here is the axillary nerve, diving through the quadrilateral space, coming out the back of the shoulder. So I always know where it is. I palpate it, palpate it to protect it. Can I see a curved Mayo scissors? Now we're going to mobilize the capsule and do a capsular release. This is our remnant of subscapularis. I'm underneath that. Subscapularis to the right, undersurface capsule to my left. We're going to separate those two. So we know that the axillary nerve is protected by the subscapularis tendon. My finger is all the way down underneath the glenoid, and I have capsule underneath my finger, subscapularis in the second layer. And we, now we can cut down on that very, very safely. So that releases the entire anterior capsule now. We're going to put in our glenoid retractors now. We want a 360 degree look at the glenoid. We're going to release uh, the intraarticular biceps tendon. This is all labrum and capsule. This is the inferior joint line of the, gl of the glenoid. Suction, please. We're going to release the inferior capsule. as well as the triceps tendon. Can I see a key elevator, please? We're going to reset our retractors here. You can see the face of the glenoid is very arthritic. We're down to subchondral bone. This guide allows us to uh, rotate our drill in multiple planes. So we'll place that down to the laser line. We're going to remove the central guide wire and we'll proceed to reaming next.
can see the central drill hole that we'll place our reamer nub into. What we want here, the patient has a bit of a concentric wear pattern. We want to get to a flat concentric fit and then drop the arm, drop the reamer down to impart about 10 degrees of inferior tilt to the glenoid. We want to get down to a level where there's some subchondral bleeding bone on the inferior surface. And we've achieved that, you can see inferiorly. We have a nice subchondral bleeding bone smile here. This is a secondary reamer for preparation of the base plate. You can see there's a smooth area on the central portion. And this reamer will remove the peripheral rim of bone. This drill then creates the center hole for our base plate. This base plate has a uh, trabecular metal coating on the back of it which allows us to get uh, ingrowth onto the base plate, which takes a tremendous amount of stress on the glenoid. And the rotation I place this in is to have one locking screw one locking screw facing the pillar of the scapula, which is here, which is about 10 degrees posterior to the uh, sagittal plane of the body. And this screw will be just behind the base of the coracoid, which is right here. Locking screw. 42, please. These are post-position locking screws. We can actually compress the base plate and then convert it to a locking device. Now we'll cyclically load each screw to compress our base plate and the trabecular metal and the trabecular metal post to the glenoid. Now we'll take these locking caps and we'll these then will be converted to a locking device. Can I have a Kittner next please? We'll take the uh, shoehorn retractor. So now we're going to replace our posterior retractors with this shoehorn type of device which will allow us to place the glenosphere. This is the glenosphere, it comes on an inserter. We're going to slide this right over the um, shoehorn retractor. Brad's going to give us a little gentle pull. Impactor please. and will impact the Morse taper. And that's the completion of the glenoid portion of the reverse shoulder replacement. We'll proceed back to the humeral side. So we'll re, uh, re ream just to make sure we haven't uh, lost any bone. We'll take the proximal reamer. It's very common often to see medial, a little bit of a medial crush from the uh, 
exposure on these osteopenic patients. Mallet. These are the trial liners. Brad's going to stay in with there. We'll take that uh, Dara out. And we want a nice clunk reduction like that. And what we do is we check the tension in our strap muscles, not too tight. We check the length of the deltoid lever arm. We'll have Brad take his retractor out, and then we're going to take it through a range of motion. We're going to go through forward elevation without any impingement. External rotation, internal rotation. And the position of instability is extension, external rotation, so that's pretty good too. There's a little bit of gapping of the liner, which is normal too. So we'll put in our real implant and we'll recheck this. Can I have an elevator, please? Take the implant. We'll take the real implant. Can you see a mallet, please? We'll trial with our real implant. on out uh, with the Dara. Come out with that. Good. That's a good reduction. We'll go with the plus six. Take my uh, elevator. Plus six, 36 standard. Okay. Now that we have the definitive humeral stem in, we'll place the definitive liner after we clean the uh, junction between liner and humeral stem. We're going to get a nice upward force from our back retractor. And so that is a standard reverse shoulder replacement. You can see our rotation here between the polyethylene and the glenosphere liner. And we'll do a standard closure in layers over a drain. So this patient will now be admitted to the hospital for two days for pain management intravenous antibiotics. She'll be placed in a sling for approximately three to four weeks. We'll allow her to start using her arm the next morning for activities of daily living. Uh, she will then progress to active range of motion. The majority of patients are taught their exercises by myself and do not need any formal outpatient therapy. At approximately four weeks, she'll be able to raise her arm on her own and then will slowly advance strengthening of her deltoid muscle, which will allow her to power or motor this reverse shoulder replacement. And the majority of patients have significant pain relief and improved function from a shoulder that was uh, quite dysfunctional and unable to raise beyond 90 degrees.